Number 68, Kolv Taroth. My favorite Elder Dragon in the entire series. Her master rank armor makes my hunter look incredibly handsome. And her ferocious beauty is unforgettable, especially when she curls around that pillar and lights the arena on fire. I bought all three of her songs on iTunes, and it is a personal recommendation for those who want to learn more about video game music. A hundred out of ten for Mommy Kolv. She is truly the mother goddess of gold. Kulturoth is one of the best new monsters world introduced, from the unique locale that is ever filled with unique endemic life to the beautiful gear. Everything about the monster and what it came with is great. Also, she introduced an amazing type of siege battle that I really hope returns in Wilds. Easily one of my favorite designs and fights in the entire franchise. There's just something truly special about a goat dragon carrying a golden armor cloak and getting scary strong once that armor comes off. Off. My favorite siege by a fair shot. Kolv has a uniquely likable character to her that no other monster in World or Iceborne has. In the weird little mannerisms she does in Phase 1 to the giant burning goddess of heat and death in Phase 3 and 4. She's also incredible blast to hunt. The only monster that I hunt for fun. I get disliking the escape timer, but most of the time, especially in Master Rank, that will never become a problem. RNG weapons are kinda yeah. I much prefer Safi's much fairer weapon system, but the Kiar goes hard. She has the best music in World Iceborne, an amazing hunt, beautiful armor, and overpowered weapons. A perfect 5 out of 5. The idea of a golden queen dragon wearing a cloak of molten gold is one of the most absurd but obvious ideas I've seen. Dragons love to hoard gold, right? So why not make a dragon that is gold? Absurd ideas like Kolv are one of the many reasons I love this franchise. Number 67, Valhazak. The cool, hairdryer sounding, deep sea, flesh rotten bacteria, virus elder dragon monster. Design is top tier, not necessarily just for how it looks, but for being so unique compared to other Kushala like elder dragons. The relationship with the effluvium is really sick too, and makes it one of the elder dragons with the best ecology for me, even though it might be very hard to bring Vol back because of it. I always adore when there's a monster that uses a unique ailment, like like Malfestio's Confusion or Mizu's Bubble Blight, for example. So Val having a unique ailment already bumps him up for me in the gameplay aspect, since it's not a very basic ailment like Hellfire Blight. The turf war with Odagaron overall makes me like it more. I really like how it does damage without even doing that much, or at least it looks like it's not doing anything. It's one of my favorite turf wars. It has a lot of aura for me. Also, the blue acid zone in the Rotten Vale is my favorite looking part of the map. Wow, the, the glowing blue of a map is my favorite part of it. So that's never happened to me before. I'm very original. So it it gets some minor points for being fought in a very cool looking part of the map that it resides in. Five stars. I think the gameplay could get some tweaks because it feels too long considering the moveset. It's an Elder Dragon. Why, what did I want? A Zitsi Yaku level monster? It doesn't do quite as much as some other Elders that also take a long time to hunt and are much more engaging than he is. And I'm not sure how to feel about being able to completely nullify his entire gimmick with a skill too, but eh, whatever. Monster Hunters take on a zombie dragon and they did a Dang good job with it on the design front. Wearing the rotted flesh of dead monsters is sick in multiple ways. I certainly want to be near this thing in real life. The fight, though, is where he suffers a little. Either he's annoying because he didn't prepare your armor skills, or he's too easy because you did. I think gear check monsters can be fine, but I don't think it's great when they're basically just trivialized by equipping certain skills. Also, I can't be the only one who's annoyed that he has a hitbox for when he falls on you after after he roars, right? Something that the other elders don't have in their roar animations? Let's shift over to the music, which is great, but I also find it so odd. You would have expected something more like Gogmazios' theme for Valhazak. Slow, eerie, creaking sounds, etc. But what we got is actually more upbeat and energetic, with some string sections that are just straight up beautiful, and it works. Why does it work? I don't understand why it fits Valhazak so well. Somebody explain to me why that one works. Anyway, four stars. His fight is what's preventing him from reaching five. Either it's annoying or it's too easy with no real middle ground. 
An easy four stars. Say what you want about Effluvium as a debuff, but as the backbone of an ecosystem, it is rather fascinating. And its relationship to Valhazak is believable enough to be cool and crazy enough to be terrifying. His design is amazingly grotesque. From his beady orange eyes to the ripe flesh that makes up his body to the half formed jaw, not the way I would have thought the devs would try their hand at an undead or corpse dragon, but I'll absolutely take it. Five stars, my favorite monster in the series. The music bops, it has an excellent design, it's got a cool armor set bonus. Some people definitely need to learn to armor set to build a set with effluvium resistance though. Unfortunately, once you do, he's actually very easy. It doesn't help that Iceborne being Iceborne, Capcom chose to not make a Master Rank Valhazak, instead opting to redesign the fights in a way that isn't as fun. I'll get to that tomorrow. No monster had me go, oh like Valhazak when I saw his cutscene for the first time. He is instantly iconic and an amazing representation of both the ecologically grounded yet otherworldly fantastical nature of Monster Hunter, and all while pushing the darker tones of Monster Hunter as far as they can go. Number 66, Teostra. One of the coolest Elder Dragons in the series. His fight is really fun and dynamic. He's got a cool design and his gear is always really strong. Plus, his design is just iconic. An extremely fun monster to fight. The unique mechanics of cycling between fire and explosions, the music, the design, awesome. A beautifully designed fire dragon that was improved massively by the addition of the blast element. The first ever Nova in the series surely deserves a five. My favorite monster. This is the monster my friend who got me into Monster Hunter described as being designed for my particular mental illness. His armor, his music, his fight, Everything about Siostra is incredibly fun and inspired. The Flame Emperor Dragon sits upon his throne rightfully, and it would take an act of God to challenge him. Five out of five, with honors, the best the series has to offer. Best of the OG Elder Trio for me. With the blast mode he gained, he's got a much more dynamic fight than the others. In my opinion, he outclasses Lunastra in pretty much all departments as well. I know some people are tired of seeing him, but like you said, Diostra is an objective perfect monster, 5 out of 5. One of my personal top tier monsters. He has such a simple design and monster concept, but when put into practice, he's such an incredible and interesting monster. The fact they actually tell you how his blast works, unlike other Elder Dragons, puts him way higher in my list than other Elders like Kieran and Kashala. And how that works is by him snapping his fangs together to generate a spark to explode the blast dust he creates and spreads around the battlefield. Field. He's based off a lion, so he's automatically cool because of that. His theme is a banger, his armor is sick, his weapons are awesome. There's probably a bunch of other things he's doing extremely better than other Elder Dragons, but that aside, love him. Five out of five. And coming from my end, the editor's end, you've heard me talk about this guy a lot. I made a whole video about him, but he means a lot to me. He's my favorite, he's my guy, he's my buddy, he's my white whale, one of my favorite sets, one of the coolest fights. I'm so glad Capcom has been so good to him for so long. Excellent design, armor, music, everything that these guys have been saying. Yeah, no, man, this just, um, I love him. I love flying Mufasa. Number 65, Garen Gold. Probably one of my favorite fanged beasts. Like the design, the fight, the ecology, and the singular little flower on his lower back. It's weirdly cute. Plus, the way he combines the lava rock and water moss for his combat with it exploding into steam attacks, and then going insane later with him putting it on his face. That's all sick. Like, I knew I would love Sunbreak the moment I fought him. Love him! Frankenstein's golem fella that creates steam explosions with his two halves of water and fire, plus being a gentle giant in tune with nature most of the time. He and the others of the three lords are just peak. It just makes me sad how easy he is to put down. Easily the best monster to come out of Sunbreak, above even Malzino, and I'm not just being biased because monkey. Garen Golm is a monster with such amazing character to it that many monsters lack. It's this giant green Frankenrilla with a pot belly and giant hands, and it's an absolute blast to hunt. Then, as if it weren't cool enough, it uses water and fire element at once by covering each arm in wet or burning rocks, which looks awesome, letting it cook up some great combos that use both elements in tandem exquisitely. Five out of five, because Garengolm is one of the most well thought out and overall best monsters to be added in a long time. 
The only thing I don't like about him is that when he launches himself with the explosive fist, the tiny little effect doesn't seem quite powerful enough to propel a beast that big. Lovely guy, friend of nature, super cool fight gimmick, and overall design. Number 64, Scorned Magnamalo. They took all the bad traits of Magnamalo and made him better, and made the good parts about him even better as well. His fight is still sick, as well as his hellfire attacks and movement options. And now the design is more sleek and cohesive with better anatomy. Less small brittle spikes and more longer arm blades that now look more useful. Along with interesting mating lore implications, he is genuinely an upgrade to the OG and a 5 out of 5. My first variant of my first flagship did not disappoint, both in the incredible fight it has and some legendary armor. I love the changes to the design with a shattered horn and extended arm blades and just the sheer, utter hatred it seems to exude when you tango with a giant samurai tiger. I only hope this isn't the last we see of him and his normal variation. He is literally Magnamalo with no downside, absolutely perfect monster, probably one of my favorite fights in video games. Much, much improved version of Magnamalo. His design has a few subtle changes to make it work a lot better. The changes to his back spikes especially come to mind. His color scheme is better, and he actually uses his forearm blades rather than having them just kind of sit there doing nothing. He has several new attacks that drastically improve the pace of the fight, and he feels so much more threatening than his base counterpart. He still is one of the least ecologically justifiable monsters in the series, though I think a small handful of monsters from Frontier are still more egregious. Not even most, I think a lot of Frontiers monsters can work in mainline. But being scorned by potential mates due to his crest being permanently damaged, he actually has some super cool detailing in his ecology. His weapons are the final form of Magnamalo's weapons, and they do not disappoint, sporting high raw, sharpness, and hefty amounts of blast damage, an excellent variation on a mediocre monster. Its edginess is justified by the fact that he can't get maidens, single forever. I love that so much. He also fixes the issue where base Magnamalo didn't use his blades, like, at all. If there was one thing I could complain about, it's the lack of dragon element attacks, but fortunately, that is my only complaint. Still, a 5 out of 5. Also, anybody notice he has an attack where he just clumsily jumps on the hunter when he's tired? Kind of an odd move. Number 63, Malfestio. What a cool and unique bird wyvern. Such a creative design with all original attacks and even a unique status effect. Would really like to see him come back because he's unlike any other bird wyvern. And he's a fun fight to boot. Finally, another of my favorite monsters appears. First off, he's an owl, my actual favorite animal in real life. He has an exclusive status called Confusion. It reverses your controls. I can definitely see and understand if people hate him for it, I love it personally. He always reminded me of magicians and has the closest thing we have to hypnosis. And without the armor looks, oh absolutely yes. Not only my 8th favorite monster, but definitely my favorite bird wyvern. Another monster I definitely want back. The birdiest bird wyvern, Malfestio is the definition of unique. The design is excellent, owls are a super fun animal to design for, and Malfestio certainly has a fun design. I love the jester look, the blue and gold work really well, and the red that gets included when enraged should not be as cool as it is. Fight-wise is where Malfestio really shines. They have an original status only used by them. Confusion, which switches your movement controls around. It's really interesting and catches you off guard. Malfestio also has sleep, which is a nice bonus. Aside from those, the move set is simple but excellent. On paper, the fight seems like it'd get really annoying, but it never does, and that's an impressive feat. Malfestio is one of, if not the best bird wyvern out there. One of my top picks for returning monsters for sure, a five out of five for this funny borb. Best Bird Wyvern, five stars. Seriously, I love Malfestio. It looks gorgeous with the blue and gold feathers, plus the little red streaks by the eyes. It has both intimidation and a little bit of goofiness. It is a completely unique skeleton and has a whole host of its own unique attacks with some really fun and clever counterplay. Confusion is hilarious too. I really want to see Malfestio come back. It's a crying shame the Jester is only in G and GU. Everyone mad at the confusion status over the years of Crybabies. It's cool that there's a status that causes the same reaction in the player as it does in the hunter. And the way you have to get better at it by learning to play through it when you do get affected makes you feel like a master of your weapon and the monster. So much so that you can do it backwards. Plus, 
owl monster. We need more Malfestio relatives based on other owls, like a snow festio or a barn owl Malfestio, or even something a little bit more distant, like a nightjar. Number 62, Sidaeus. One of the best final bosses, at least from a narrative perspective. This is because we don't simply kill him, we shave off his horn and he is on his way, which is kind of wholesome. Outside of that, he is an awesome design with cool ecology that takes so many different features from many different sea creatures to make him a true god of the ocean. I especially love the Dunkleosteus aspects about him. I would pay good money to see a Sidaeus fight in a Carcos. He has a great gear and while the fight might need a bit of work in future games, it isn't actually bad once you get to the final phase, so I'm gonna give him a 5. I love how he ends Tri's story, one of the best themes as well. First ever hunt with this guy is an absolute spectacle, really love the combination of several creatures in his design, half Dunkleosteus, half whale body shape with two big ass horns, and a marvelous beard. That, and he has probably the most breathtaking monster theme song in the franchise, Moonquake. One heck of a story boss monster this guy was. Underwater fighting perfected, Tri has been leading up to this moment all game. Finally taking on Sidaeus and succeeding filled me with such joy that it made me fall in love with the series. I started on PSP, but Tri was the game that cemented Monster Hunter as my favorite game series ever. And this monster was the culmination of that entire journey. Alatrion and Gen were definitely much more epic spectacles, but the first Sidaeus is something that you never forget. Maybe my favorite Elder Dragon of all time. It just has this majesty and awe to it that I feel isn't portrayed as well in game with any other monster. The chase part of the hunch goes to show you just how little of a threat it thinks you are. While in the actual battle, it pulls out all the stops, showing you exactly why it didn't think you were a threat. Not exactly some force of nature like some other elders, but it definitely deserves that spot based on presence alone. Five stars. Probably my favorite design in the whole series. Great weapons, great armor, fantastic music, and a pretty good fight. I'd also say Goldbeard is probably the best variant subspecies in my opinion, but that only works because of the fantastic monster it's based on. Five out of five. Number 61, Anjanath. It might be a pink fire-breathing T-Rex, but it's our pink fire-breathing T-Rex that literally gained a cult canonically and absolutely deserves it. This is it, lads. This is my favorite monster in the whole series. As someone majorly into dinosaurs and paleo in general, Anjanath is an exceptional way to stylize a Tyrannosaurus into a truly monstrous creature while still keeping it fresh and interesting. I adore the little details like the back sails and the extendable nose, and his lore and ecology, especially in world with its role in the ancient forest are all pretty solid. I sincerely hope Anja becomes a series regular. He's so cool. Easiest five of my life. This guy is every issue I have with some of World's designs, but done incredibly well. Anjanath is simply an absolute classic already. Simple and perfectly effective, and I love that. Anjanath is my grillmeister. I let that guy cook my meat, and I trust him with my life. Five stars. He's not the best thing ever, but what he does is great. They made the right choice using Anjanath to show off the living environment aspects that World was going for. Side note, it's interesting that the game devs have brutally killed Anjanath three times to show the threat of something else. Frozen Saw by Vel'Kana, Suck Dry by the Kyrios, and Thrashed Around by Legiacris. Hopefully that one can actually make it into a finished game. It's a good, big, scary dinosaur that introduces tougher monsters very well. Has enough visual flair while keeping quite pared back to really effectively move towards that nature documentary type of feel that World was going for. It's built up as the first big hurdle in the game very well. It does new and interesting things with the Brute Wyvern skeleton. It's the first real flagship of World, frankly. Number 60, Furious Rajang. Great conceptually. I like how the removal of the tail works as a limit breaker. Doctor turn off my pain inhibitors type of beat. He got a lot of great moveset additions in Gen 5 that made him scarier than regular Rajang in your first hunt, and then actually easier after you master it due to how much more room for counterattacks it gives. His equipment isn't top tier, but it's still very fun to play with, especially the furious armor skill in Sunbreak. Super Simeon is a title that goes hard by itself, but then goes even harder when you realize it's a reference to Super Saiyan. Also, his grab attack feels like your hunter is being submitted to the ultimate violence in monkey form. Elite Monster, 5 out of 5. 
Four stars. I feel very similar about Furious Rajang and the regular Rajang. The ecology of losing his tail is great, new lightning attacks are tough but fair, and his new grabs are so visceral that you can't help but love it. The main issue I have is the same as the original, that being how many of his attacks trigger Tremor, which guarantees being hit by this guy. And the fact that some of his attacks, like his repeat punch move and his triple fist slam, come out almost instantly, sometimes giving very little time to react. Only issue exclusive to him is his weak point, when he's mega enraged, trying to hit his head while his red arms keep deflecting your attacks, makes weapons like Longsword and Switch Axe a chore to use against this guy. He can pick you up, smash you repeatedly into the ground, bring you close to his face, laser you point blank while screaming, then he does a street fighter spinning pile driver 80 feet in the air, smash you into the crust of the earth, and this is all one move. Five out of five. Four stars, a fast paced fight, and I love the theme and super cool design. Only problem is the arms, which ruin the pace of the fight and don't allow me to have as much fun when they harden, but that's the only complaint. Furious Rajang is a bullshit, unfair, nightmare of a monster, which is exactly what it's supposed to be. Five out of five, wouldn't change a thing. Number 59, Nursilla. I think Nursilla having its own storyline and map features really helps make it that much cooler. She somehow feels a lot more than just a spider with those secret jaws it hides. That and its cries are so good. 5 out of 5 for those who don't have arachnophobia from fighting this massive spider. Loved it the moment I saw it, because it introduced the spider classification, the Temnoceran but also because it wears Gypsaros skin as a protective hide. That spider regularly kills one of my most disliked monsters in the series, and I support that. Nursula owns the area she first gets introduced in in a way few other monsters in that generation or even future generations ever have. Seeing Gypsaros carcasses hanging on webs throughout the map builds anticipation for the fight, and it pays off spectacularly. Bonus points for having some of the best sound design in the whole series, too. Nursula has so many interesting part breaks and mechanics, poison spikes that drip on you and poison fangs that pop out, a sleep tip stinger, swinging from webs, a back covered in Gypsaros skin, shooting webs at you, easily my favorite monster in the series and one I feel is criminally underrated. Great gear with fun stats and Shrouded Nursla is fantastic on top of that. I seriously do not think any monster compares in terms of mechanics and details. Only fodder in GU and in high rank. Really fun fight. Had to switch weapons and style just to exploit an elemental weakness, which was fun. Not too difficult, but has a fun intensity throughout pretty consistently. Number 58, Fulgur Anjanath. This is a magnificent subspecies. Not only does it use the thunder element in some pretty novel ways, it's also visually awesome. There's only really one main flaw I could point to, and it's something Iceborne as a whole seemed to struggle with. Say it with me. It lives absolutely everywhere, and with Fulgur, there isn't even that much meme power to be gained. If it ever comes back, I'd like to see its habitat range be cut down significantly. Now with that aside, let's focus on the positives, which are pretty stellar. Most subspecies are only visually distinct through colors, not this one. When it lights up with thunder, Vulgar looks nothing less than a amazing. Even the nostrils are glowing. It also innovates on the thunder element a fair bit. Instead of blasting pure electricity, its use of it mostly consists of enhanced charges and electric snot. Yes, you heard me right. Electric snot. Now I'm kind of wishing Ketcha had a subspecies like this. I feel like Fulgur along with Coral really perfect the concept of elemental swap subspecies, and I'd love to see it return more than most other variations. All in all, Fulgur is pretty amazing. It has a lot going for it while maintaining so much of what made the regular version awesome. I have to say that I like it even more than the normal Anjanath, aside from some habitat problems and the lack of a cutscene. Seriously, why doesn't this one have a cutscene? This is one of my favorite subspecies the series has to offer. I genuinely think this is one of, if not the best looking monster designs in the series. The orange and white with the black stripes is great on its own, and then the electric blue on the mouth, nose, and sails while it's all enraged looks immaculate. 
Fulgur Anjanath keeps on the trend of Iceborne having the best subspecies in the series. Fulgur, in my humble opinion, is a triumph. It is so good, I would prefer Fulgur coming back to future games instead of the regular Anjanath. Unique projectiles in the form of Electrified Snot, a super move that ain't just a Nova, increased aggression and incredible visuals, it has everything anyone could ever want in a monster. Five out of five. I feel like the charged roar alone should put him at the top, but I'll throw him a couple more bones too. As subspecies go, this is grade A material. His design is really cool and how the body is like a white tiger and the head is a normal tiger. Makes him look more befitting as a Tigrex than the actual Tigrex. His moveset feels pretty fresh with the electric aftershocks and new jaw maneuvers, and I was astounded when I saw that he was the first nomadic subspecies in the series. That may seem simple in concept, but the idea of a base monster being a specialist and then the evolved form to break from those restraints and go anywhere is kinda sick. Fulgur is my favorite Gen 5 subspecies, and I wouldn't change that for anything. Five out of five. Fulgur is probably one of the best dinosaur monsters. Great fight, amazing sound design, and the armor carried me through world up until Alatrion. Number 57, Ruiner, Nergigante. While you were grinding Master Rank, I studied the bleed. Master Rank Nergigante is still Nergigante, and so he will still get five stars. I'd say that this fight was sufficiently upgraded from his base form, with the addition of bleed and the spike projectiles on his attacks, plus the plethora of completely new moves he got as well. Maybe still a little bit too easy for an elder, especially since he only unlocks for real at Master Rank 100, and by that time you've probably got really good gear, but he's still a very engaging and satisfying hunt, especially when he's tempted. He might surprise you with some carts if you're not careful. Mystera Jerky just wasn't so OP, Ruiner would probably be one of the scariest elders of Iceborne. If you didn't pack Jerky for him in your first Iceborne playthrough, then he probably beat you up a little bit in that pre-Shara battle. Overall, he's just more Nergigante. He gave us a tougher fight, some cool extra story, and overall served to make Nergigante even cooler all around. I do wish that regular Nergigante's original dive bomb wasn't completely removed though, that's kind of a shame. Many also think that the arch temper theme for regular Nerg should have been used for Ruiner instead of the normal theme, and I think I agree. The original isn't bad in my opinion, but the AT theme just would have fit very well. By this point in the story, Nergigante really feels like the hunter's rival. The AT theme captures that extremely well, but unfortunately it's stuck to the Shara cutscene. But Ruiner still manages to be a great variant despite those things. Although next time we see Nerg in Master Rank, I hope it's the base form so that he can get a new Master Rank armor set like Basil got in Sunbreak. Ruiner is a firm downgrade on regular Nergi. He's still a cool monster that I go out of my way to fight, but that's only because Master Rank Nergi isn't a thing. It took his whole spike thing and made it worse. He lost his dive bomb, which is his coolest move by far in favor of a ground slam that's kind of easy to avoid. Also, why the f did they give him bleed? It makes sense why Nergi Gante would have it, but bleed just shaves off 15 seconds of the hunt every time you get it, and you might get it like dozens of times. The Nergigante of Master Rank, and the only Nergigante of Master Rank. Again, weird way to do variants, however, Ruiner may be the best variant in the game. Design-wise, it's just Nergigante with silvery spikes and black horns. Not that much different. What makes it like this is, well, not really apparent when you first fight it. It's the same battle, with some bleed added in, and it gets some new moves from the AT Nergigante. The initial battle with Ruiner Nergigante doesn't last too long. As the true final boss of Iceborne story, Shara Ishvalda rears its head. After a long fight with that vibrational beast, it then rears back to life, and the supposedly slain Ruiner takes to the air and then lands the finishing blow, feeding on the most powerful elder in the new world. It then flies off to the Guiding Lands, waiting for you to find it for a proper clash. The fact that they made a variant off of the base game's flagship has such an interesting twist on the final story quest, and it serves as a teaser for the post-game grind. Yeah, that alone makes me applaud them for that. Scorn Magnamalo wishes it had half this level of integration in Sunbreak. Like I said before, the fight is just Arch-Tempered Nergigante plus a couple of new moves, but it adds on to an already solid fight in a decent way. In the Guiding Lands, we can see it clashing with plenty of other top-tier monsters and coming out on top of each and every one of them. Not to mention, they add an event quest where we get to face a Tempered Ruiner, who gives such excellent rewards that I did that quest dozens of times. And that's not an exaggeration on that count. One of the few times I hunted with random players, leading to fights where we bullied the overpowered Elder and 
and ended its existence in 10 minutes. The community got so damn good at facing this monster. I'm so impressed that they made this variant part of the main story of Iceborne. It's just a better version of the basic Nergigante fights, and it gave such a good quest. Even if it never returns, this is what I find to be the peak version of the monster. Five out of five. Cooler armor and weapons, but a worse fight. They took out urgency of breaking his spikes by removing the dive bomb. Not to mention, he's really easy for when he became available. Four stars. Being locked behind Master Rank 100 hurt the experience a bit, but overall, he is an upgrade of a five-star monster. Also, the fact that his fight changes depending on what spikes you break makes every hunt feel a little unique. Unlike regular Nergigante, where the cycle is white spikes, then black spikes, then the dive bomb, then repeat. Number 56. Dire Morales. Dyer Morales' design is immaculate. The idea of a volcanic dragon is so peak, it's insane. And I love how his mechanics play into his ecology. You have to fight him on a beach because his body is so hot that he has to regulate his own temperature through the ocean. The theme, the atmosphere, everything is truly 10 out of 10 for Dyer. A low 5 star to a high 4 star. Dyer Morales has an amazing design with hauntingly beautiful music. I would love to see him in a new game with underwater combat. If anything, his moveset needs to diverge a bit from the Fatalis trio. He was a monster that I was definitely looking forward to fighting, but I was nervous since I wasn't sure if I could solo him. That music hit me just as hard as the first Meteor did. I found myself liking the underwater portion because it allowed me to hit whatever part I wanted. If I remember correctly, I beat him on an attempt where I missed a Dragonator shot. Dire Morales is a great final boss for G rank. Then, a few months ago, I saw that Dire Morales, as well as his fellow Black Dragons, are getting plushies. I had to get Dire Morales, so he may get many hugs. Dyer's pretty interesting because they pick some memorable bits from all three of the old Fatalis fights, Black standing and crawling movesets, Crimson's Meteors, and White's armor mode at 50% health, mixed them all together and gave it the third gen glow up, said f*** it, let's make him big as Lao Shen Lung and throw him in the ocean, and it all just worked out really well, giving us one of the most memorable final boss fights in the series. In a meta sense, he lives up to his destruction and creation theming, because he's the reason we didn't get a Gen 3 Fatalis fight, with Gen 3 being the only generation that Fatalis has missed, but quite literally served as the bedrock for Gen 4 reworks of Fatalis, and probably helped the team see what worked for a more involved giant monster fight for something like Gogmazios. 5 out of 5 stars, Dyer was a great capstone for Gen 3 to end on and provided a solid foundation going forward. It's a really cool concept and design. Its fight is just a big Fatalis with spots to pop and meteors. So a big Crimson Fatalis with spots to pop and no wind or flight. I feel like they took the general structure and stances and big explosions and dropping things and super duper refined that into Gargmazios. If it comes back, it'll need basically a brand new moveset, if there's hope to make it a unique fight. It's still a good and fun fight, and I like Pop of the Weak spots, and that's the main thing it has going for it, and it's very unique compared to Gogmazios or Fatalis, but that's basically it currently. Three stars for design and fun, but lack of unique moveset. Dire Morales is a cool, crazy concept. Giant volcano dragon that submerges itself to cool its overflowing heat and lava sounds awesome. And it very much is an awesome design. Unfortunately, I think its fight is rather uninteresting. It seems to rely more on its volcanic volleys, which you really can't see because you're stuck to its foot or you're underwater, assuming you're a blade master and not a gunner. Its physical movements are big and ponderous. I think they could bring it back and do much, much better with it. As it is now, it's not bad, but I also don't think it's that great. Three stars. Number 55. We welcome Fortuan back for his third entry, talking about Agnactor. Hello, once again, Fortuan from the Hunter's Hub. Next is Agnactor. And Agnactor is another great monster, in my opinion. Now, I know everyone loves the Gaiacris, but Ignactor really stood out to me when I first played Try, especially because of the ecology of it having a gas, but not being able to ignite its own gas and doing that clack, 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 and just boom, and then, like, it was so powerful, he couldn't even control it initially. He had to sort of, like, right his head like a fire hose going off suddenly, and, you know, had to, like, rest it into control. Always loved Ignactor, and I've been really really hoping to see him again, especially since Rise did his dirty with giving Uruktars 
and not an Agnactor. So, without further ado, let's get to the comments on Agnactor. Our first one comes from Mallow2902. A five-star Leviathan for sure. Agnactor is at least tied for my favorite Leviathan in the series. His lava armor gimmick is really unique and he's got some fun attacks to play around, including a really tricky fake out slide that you will never dodge on your first time fighting him. His signature beat clapping sound is iconic. Next is from Andrew HZ5ZC. He's the perfect blend of an awesome design with awesome gameplay mechanics. He heats up when he digs, walks in the lava, and or fires his laser. So the fight is really fun as you focus on capitalizing on when his weak spots are hot. If you break apart, it also becomes permanently a good hit sound, adding even more strategy and complexity. Then here's his funny clacking. The fact that he's a grown-up Uruktar and a lot of his attack animations that all just give him so much personality. Honestly, he's one of the best monsters out there and he's not even a flagship or anything like that. He needs to come back to a new game. Next is Ienzo 69 demy Agnactor has a unique mechanic in its heat armor, high speed mobility with how it can burrow from locations that are not on the floor, and an amazing sound for its attacks, roar, and telegraph. It's a fantastic monster that keeps getting the short end of the stick. Next we have L.T.C3847. Agnactor is an interesting monster. Of all the lava swimmers, it's hard to find the most reasonable. Very streamlined to make up for the viscous medium, something a Cantor and even Lava Seath utterly fail at. It still has a relatively compact and dense form to expose minimal surface area for heat exchange to the lava. Know how it only really flares the fins when on land and not in the lava, and has tangible effects with the cooling armor on its body. With areas built around it diving from floor to ceiling and its iconic sound design, it is close to a 5 for me. But it just lacks that extra something special to put it over the edge. Leviathans are so water dependent as a class, I feel it could just be a little more different derived to suit its magma laden habitat and to burrow through rock. Maybe bigger claws, maybe a slimmer torso, I'm not sure. But ultimately, to me, it's an absolute 4.9 star monster. And finally, we have Athos9293. Fight-wise, he is much superior to Legaikris, the best Leviathan to come out of Tri for sure. The fact that he's often just called Clack Clack Beam shows how distinctively iconic and high personality he is. His moveset is so well balanced around the lava armor mechanic that it makes for a delicious combat flux. Armor set goes hard, and I appreciate the fact that it's guard-centered. Five out of five for sure. This is Fortuan again, and so there you have it. I'm not the only one that actually likes this creature. Uh, it's amazing, and I love it, and I want it to come back. And Capcom, if you're listening, don't you dare give us Uruktars and not Ignactor again. All right, thanks, everyone. Later. Number 54, Violet Mizutsune. We all agree that this should have been Thunderbubble, or at least something other than fire. The fact that Violet is still absolutely a 5-star monster despite that says a lot. A crazy challenging and fun fight, and the Mizutsune theme taking over the Infernal Springs theme was just too good of a moment. It is, in my opinion, a big achievement that they made two Fire Mizutsune, yet they are both so different that I honestly don't care if they share the same element. You can't compare them in my eyes. While we do have way too many Fire Monsters in the franchise, Capcom is able to make so many different things with it. Simple projectiles or beams, Acnosom's bouncing fireballs, the Metal Rat's Hellfire mode, Basarius' armor heat up, Agnactral Lavasioth Magma Drawn armor heat up, hardening, even Espinas' triple status fireball effect. Violet Mizutsune uses petrol, basically, instead of soap foam. The bubbles indeed home in like the ones from Thunderbubble. They add a new level of danger since you have to look out for the Firefox and them. The difficulty difference is very much appreciated, one of Sunbreak's best fights. I do wish that the advanced changes would be implemented into the regular moveset should it return, and did I mention the spirit bomb that it has? Then there's the theme transition. Every rare species should have that in the future, since they're supposed to be the strongest versions of themselves. It really adds to the cinematic feeling. 
and its armor is the biggest reason I picked up the Lance. It is now my seventh and last main weapon. Lance is underrated and underestimated. You should give it a chance. Five stars. Fun fact, it is the only large monster to use an all element defense down debuff in the entire franchise. Violet Mizutsune is the last rare species as of writing this. Glad we get to end this wonderful group with a bang. The design is gorgeous, replacing the pinks and yellows with lovely blues and purples, which I prefer depending on the day. They're both beautiful. Fight wise, Violet is fantastic. It takes a lot from the regular up to 11. It is fast moving with some great attacks and a handful of new moves, which makes this the best that Mizu has to offer. The big bubble ultimate is wonderful and rewarding if you're able to exploit it by damaging Violet enough. I don't mention music that much in these. I don't think I've mentioned it at all, actually, but the way Violet's fight changes from the arena theme to Mizu's theme when enraged is just perfection. While yes, I do agree that it should have been Thunderbubble in its place, that doesn't diminish the fact that Violet is one of the best rare species in Monster Hunter. Five out of five. I generally don't appreciate the Sunbreak Fire Monster Bloat, but I make the exception for Violet Mizutsune, the best variation of Mizu by a long shot. His colors and effects are gorgeous, and fight-wise he feels like the pinnacle of what this monster is capable of. He was the first monster in Sunbreak to really make me struggle, and I love the way that this theme prevails over the arena theme after a certain damage threshold. He sure as hell makes up for that sorry apex. Number 53, Gameth. I think she's a near perfect monster. Her design is fantastic, a giant mammoth, maybe even a glimpse into the icy past, with beautiful vibrant colors of red, white, and blue. And of course, her massive tusks. And while I think her fight gets more flack than it deserves, I also recognize that she is nowhere near her highest potential. I would absolutely love to see her come back, especially in wilds where she could actually travel with, defend, and maybe even fight alongside the Popo. Four out of five stars. Side note, a really underrated part of her design, in my opinion, are the spikes on the inside of her trunk. It's a unique thing that makes her looks more battle-ready. It's a biggin. I do hope they can finally put her in wilds with a revamped fight. Gameth has yet to have her finest hour. She could be great, but at the moment, it's just the uniqueness of a mammoth design in Monster Hunter that does a lot of heavy lifting, in my opinion of her. Her theme is also pretty good, but I think a modern rendition could really exemplify her enormity. I'll give her four stars, but she could easily be five if they give her some much needed love. This sits nestled at the top of the Faded Four after many experiences with all hunts for each. Design-wise, it may seem like she's lacking, but Gameth doesn't need too much flair as her design choices are straight to the point as a giant mammoth, with big bulky armor and weapon designs following suit. Now, I'm not holding out too much hope, and it may be a bit of cope, but I feel that Wilds may finally bring her back, and I feel that would be an incredible return to the sixth generation. All right, hear me out. Both in terms of theme and design, Gameth is top tier, at least in my opinion. But then you get to the fight and it's kinda underwhelming? Don't get me wrong, the first couple of attacks are super imposing, but once you figure out the best way to do things is to just stand next to the hind legs, dodge the occasional back slam, and keep attacking, the fight becomes neither exciting nor particularly challenging. In my experience, it was a pretty boring fight for what is such a cool creature. That's why Gameth deserves to return. It already has a lot of things going for it, putting it in wilds would give them the opportunity to make it truly excellent, make it more mobile, give it attacks with its hind legs, give it a full-on unstoppable elephant charge, a fast one I mean. There's so much they could do with Gameth, and I'm sure it would have far surpassed the Vespoid Queen in the Hunter's Choice poll if it had had a 6th generation reimagining under its belt. 